It's good to see all of you this morning for day two of Queen City Merge. I'm glad to have you here. Our first speaker this morning is Sarah Morgan. She's the founder of Tailored. And give her a big round of applause, please. Thanks. Hi, guys. Good morning. Sorry, I would be using a, a, I guess, a lapel mic, as they were saying, but there's nowhere to clip it on to. So you're just, I'm going to have to do a little Vanna White stuff over here. Um, I am the founder of Tailored, um, tailored.co. It's a personalized shopping site for brides. And I'm actually here, I worked with Chris Moore uh, previously at, a, at my first kind of venture into startups. And so I'm really excited to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. And I just feel really honored and honestly really excited. So I'm gonna put this on here first, actually, because it's a little awkward to hold. But um, tell me if you can't hear me. I'm a pretty loud talker. So you just let me know if you guys can't hear me in the back. Um, first and foremost, I want you guys to know I am not tech. I am standing up here as the epitome of someone who is the opposite, I think, of what you would picture someone being who's starting a website. Um, I happenstance got into doing startups. I was a broadcast journalism major from college and went through that kind of quarter life crisis after having a couple of jobs that I was not passionate about at all, um, with really trying to kind of, much to my parents' chagrin, figure out what I wanted to do with my life and how I was going to impact the world and all that good stuff. I was going to travel. and. Um, someone randomly, the guy that's not someone, my current co-founder randomly found my resume uh, on my very old resume on Career Builder of all places and convinced me to come in. He wanted me originally to help him with sales. I didn't want to do it. Um, I didn't even want to come in. I took my famous thing is that I took the interview over the phone in a bikini sitting by the pool having a beer on a Friday afternoon. So obviously was not in the job searching mentality and could not be I mean, when they say that things happen for a reason, it could not have been a better fit. I came in and talked to him and he said, have you ever been involved in startups before? It's a really cool way to kind of have vertical movement and to make your impact and everything you do has a direct impact on the company and, and the community. And I just love the idea of that and hit the ground running. And there have been so many moments um, since kind of my startup journey that I've just thought that I am absolutely in the right place. Um, and that's uh, the reason why I opened this up to talk to you guys about this is I know that being in startups and I know that being online isn't an easy journey. Um, it's definitely one for me that has been a surprising journey. I've gone through two years without a salary before we raised our first round of funding, um, whittled through my savings. I was based, my first company that I worked with, Wedzilla, I was based outside of Washington, DC. And I am now living in Palo Alto. Um, I started there as the director of marketing actually started as an account executive and said to the guy who was the founder then and my current co-founder, Aaron, I want to make a bigger impact. I want to really have, I want to build a brand for you. Um, he said, we're, that's not even in our business model. We're not marketing. We're not doing any public relations. That's not something that I feel like is really important to the company. And I felt completely the opposite. And so he gave me four weeks to get out there and get our name in the press, to go out and start networking with people. And in two weeks, I was director of marketing, and I was like, if I can do this, I can do anything, I'm gonna keep working, um, and I'm really gonna make an impact here. And so we started working around the clock. I was talking to users all the time. I was getting on a bus from Washington, D.C. and going to New York and meeting with people that, as Aaron said, my co-founder, um, I had no business talking to. And <laughs> it was true. I mean, I was sitting in front of the boards of Brides Magazine. Um, can you hear, oh, can you guys hear me okay? Um, I was sitting in front of the board of Brides Magazine, talking to them about what I was doing at Wedzilla, um, sitting in front of six executives that had been in the wedding space for 20 years. I'd never been in the wedding space, never been in tech, and they were all taking notes on things that I was saying. And I say this not to say, oh my gosh, you know, how cool you were in front of the board and, and things like that, but to say that you really genuinely, if you believe in yourself, other people will believe in you too. And as cheesy as that sounds, that's kind of the way that I want to kick this off. Um, so after moving to Palo Alto, which is where I live now, and doing my third iteration in the wedding space, I am now the founder of Tailored. So that's kind of my long story short. Um, one of the biggest challenges, and why I wanted to touch and, and kind of have my talk be, if you just build it, they won't come, 
has been communicating with my development team and really getting them to understand how important it is to get out of the kind of internal space I think that we can all get in where you think you know what the user wants, you think you know what you need to build, you think you know what your company brand, you know, company brand, your persona is, and you really actually have no clue. Um, I've been there, I've done that. I've talked to my developers a lot about how important I think it is that they're our biggest power user. I have no life, <laughs> literally. I am on our site all the time. And they tease me about it. I'll find little things here and there that, that I really think are important, um, that I think we need to change, or a little feature that I want to tweak. And it's because I've made myself the biggest power user. Uh, the first thing that I want to kind of touch on, I guess, and in my talk about getting out of, of the building and really kind of making your mark would be building a brand persona. So what I want you guys to realize is that you should always be building. And I guess my first question is how many of you guys are developers? So how many of you, okay. And then how many of you guys are on the right brain kind of marketing PR stuff? Okay, awesome. So this, I want this to be applicable to both of you guys. When I am building you know, a story for the Huffington Post, I currently write for the Huffington Post and Brides Magazine and Headline News. And one of the things that I always think about before I start a story is, who am I writing to? And I tell my developers and my designers to think about that as well. We all have one brand persona. And ours, as cheesy as it sounds, is actually Blake Lively. So any of the girls out there who know who that is, um, she's on Gossip Girl. She's just a, she's a celeb. So she has nothing to do with our website. But I loved her look. I loved her kind of like fierce independence. I thought she was a trendsetter. And I thought she had a very fresh voice. And so we use her to design, to build, to write for. Um, it may not be a celebrity. It may just be somebody on your site. But have one person that you guys are cohesively looking to. This exercise is super important. So if you sit down and talk to people and say, listen, what do you want from the site? Let me user test with you. Walk them through the site. See what they like. See what they don't like. And then see what you're taking away from your user case and build a brand persona around that. Your voice should be consistent through your design. And what I mean by that is, do you have a really loud brand presence? Is there actually, you know, when you're doing the onboarding process, is there a voice that takes you through every little feature? And is that voice consistent with your editorial voice? Is whoever's writing for you or whoever's getting your name out in the public, are they kind of personifying that brand as well? And you'll have a much more cohesive vision about the direction of where you're headed if you guys are all on the same page. So it may be a collaboration of a bunch of different feedback you get from users. But you can't get that feedback if you're not getting out of the office, if you're not working with people that are actually using your site, and if you're not building for them as opposed to what you think the greatest vision is. Um, I think one of the issues that I had with Wedzilla, my first company, was building features that I thought I wanted, that I thought my friends wanted, that I was so stubbornly passionate <laughs> about building. And then I built and built and built, and people were not using or I guess I should say Chris built and built and built wherever you are, um, people were not coming to the site and we couldn't figure out why. And we weren't talking to our users and we didn't have a cohesive kind of, I would say mission statement for the company. Um, how many of you guys, if you are a developer or designer, work closely with someone who's getting your brand out there? That's great, I mean that's huge. One of the biggest issues, when we moved from Washington DC to Palo Alto, California, one of the, biggest issues that we had with our company was finding really good back-end people because neither myself, my co-founder is a little bit technical, but I'm not a technical co-founder. And the guy that accepted us into the program there, and if you don't know what that is, it's just an incub incubator program in the Valley, Valley um, Dave McClure's 500 Startups. But when we went through the program, he said, I'm letting you guys in. You actually have the opposite problem that a lot of companies do. You need to find really strong technical people and a lot of the companies that we're working with can build a great product but don't know how to get people to that product. Um, so the first piece of advice I would say is really build a brand persona. Does anyone have a brand persona now that's building their company? Do you, do you design for a person or ha do you have it written out somewhere? This is who our user case is. Anyone? Okay, it is the single best piece of advice I've ever gotten. Every article that I write, honestly, I mean, I. I like want to hammer this on so much, but every article that I write, every, every feature that I go through, whenever we're sitting in a group, I think, does this match what our end goal is? And it's okay if that brand persona has to change. Um, but it's really important that you guys know who you're writing and designing for. And then you can call each other out on it, which is great. Saying, listen, you know, you built this feature, but 
it's really supportive of, for my case, you know, bridesmaids. And our user case is brides. And this isn't even you know, in tune with where we're going and what our mission statement is. So the next thing I would say is, um, in addition to the working with people and the, and, the, um, and the brand persona, is getting your brand out there. So how many of you guys are actively writing or getting people to come to your website through use, leveraging the media? So one, anyone else? Two, three, okay. Uh, I'm a little bit biased. I am a broadcast journalism major and that's really where kind of my interest lies. But there's something really amazing about leveraging your brand and your company to be a resource for the masses. So when you think about media presence, I think a, the problem is that a lot of people think, okay, I'm gonna get my name out there and I'm just gonna talk about how tailored is the most amazing website that's ever come across the face of the earth. Jesus himself created it and now it's here and everyone needs to go use it. And that's not it. Pick what you're passionate about. Pick what you're really gung-ho about. Why did you build this company? Why are you working for this company? And then think about how you can be a resource to other people that are in the same industry. So if you're building a website to help people with their finances, let's say it's a tool that helps you get out of debt, for example, be a resource for those that need your website. Don't barf up to people why they need to come to your website. Be a resource and they'll come to you as kind of a second nature thing. They'll wanna do business with you because now you've built their trust. So I do a lot of PR and marketing around wedding trends. I'm not engaged, I'm not married, and to be honest with you, I feel like this company has been a black, black cat on my love life because I talk about it so much, but, um, but I always try to be a resource for brides. I talk about trends, I talk about what's going on in pop culture. If a celebrity's getting engaged, I try and talk about how you can get her look for less. It sounds you know, cheesy and it sounds kind of silly, especially I'm sure to the guys in the audience that don't really kind of uh, I guess relate to that, but it really helps. Um, I talk to I talk to brides about what are your biggest struggles. What are you doing from a budget standpoint that you feel like you really need help with? How can I be of service to you? I talk with other industry vets. I honestly um, try to be everyone's and this is cheesy too, but bestie. Like I try to be someone that people can come to no matter what the issue is. So if that's an industry person, and let's say someone for a bride's magazine needs a resource on how to save money for your big day, I want them to immediately want to pick up the phone and call me. And do not be afraid to be persistent. When you're going out there to be a resource and you see someone write an article, so let's say I see somebody write an article about saving money for your wedding. I'm not afraid to tweet and say, hey, that was a really great article. You may have missed this. Or maybe I write them a, you know, an email and say, hey, I loved your piece on this. I actually had a question I'd love to respond. I just wrote a piece on headline news. Uh, the subject was, is Pinterest crashing your wedding? And the whole concept was, is Pinterest, these visual pin boards, taking away the element of surprise and creativity because brides are just replicating them. And then once you get to somebody's wedding, you've, you've kind of been there, done that, seen it before. And I wrote to the person that wrote the article and I said, I really respectfully disagree with your opinion. Awesomely well written, really like what you're saying. Can I have a chance to rebut? And I did, and it was on the homepage of Headline News. Um, it, was, it was amazing, it was an amazing traffic driver to our website and not once in there did I say what Taylor does. I never said we do personalized shopping, I never said we use machine learning for you know, recommend products every step of the way. I didn't pitch them at all. And it was one of our best press pieces. And it was because I was a resource. And all of a sudden when you're under your byline it just says wedding industry vet veteran and founder of taylor.co, Sarah Morgan, that's all. That was the one sentence. And it was one of our best drivers. So don't think that PR or marketing has to be you kind of saying all the reasons why people should be coming to your website. If you can prove yourself that you're an expert in your industry, they'll come regardless. Um, another thing is people say, and this is one of the questions I get asked a lot, um, how many of you guys aren't doing media or aren't doing PR because you have no idea where to start or kind of how to get in touch with the right people? Okay, so we've got a couple. How many think that it's out of your budget so it's not something you really want to focus on right now? Uh, one of the biggest things that I would would say to that is it's core to getting your brand out there and getting people to your site is core to making sure you survive. I know we've all been there where we want to throw up our hands in the air and just give up and a lot of times it's just it's it's just because people don't know about you. You're building a great product but people don't know how to get there. They don't even know you excuse me, they don't even know you exist. So when it comes to getting in touch with the right people, it's a lot easier than you think. Um, there's a website called Cision. It's C I S I O N. 
And it basically gives you access to every editor you could possibly imagine. Uh, I did hire an outside PR firm for the past few months, and it's not something I would say that's imperative to your business, but it definitely is something that I would say is helpful. Uh, if you have to do it on your own, get a website like Cision where you can type in, if you're in the financial world, for example, you know, Forbes Business, and I can give you a list of editors. And then start reaching out to them. Meet them for coffee, uh, meet them for lunch, meet them for dinner, and don't go with the objective to pitch them. Go with the objective of saying, I love what you write about and I'd love to learn more about what interests you. I'd love to kind of hear your perspective on a few things I'm building. And then as those relationships start to form, and trust me, they will, and they will really quickly, um, you'll start to really get invaluable contacts and things that'll carry over from business to business. Some of the best press relationships that I have now, I actually got from hopping on a bus five days a week and going from DC to New York and meeting these people for coffee and dinners and lunches. And my co-founder would say to me, I don't understand nothing's coming of this. You're meeting with these people and the meetings aren't going anywhere. Where's our press? What are we doing? And I said, trust me, it's gonna come. And a few months later, after building these relationships, I have this really strong Rolodex of people that I can call upon any time. You know, and there, yeah, of course there are times that they say no, but to say, listen, I really need your help. I need you to kind of put me out there again, or I, you know, what can I, what kind of content can I give you that you're really struggling for right now? And they'll come back to me with story ideas and I'll write for them and I'll, I'll get out there. If you guys are, don't feel like you're strong writers, get some journalism interns. Make sure that they understand your brand persona. Get them to start going on Twitter for you, on Facebook. But no matter what, you know, even if it's not an area of expertise that you have, no matter what, it's an important place for you guys to be is in the public eye. And you can tweak things as you go. You know, you can kind of figure out what people respond to, what they don't. I've learned from the past, I guess, three months with Tailored, what's going to hit and what isn't. And I'm not always right, but I'm starting to learn as I go through what people respond to and what they don't, um, what's going to be link bait and what isn't. And that's obviously a learning process, but it's something that you have to start to do to get out there before you can really kind of tweak the business side of things. You never know, you know, kind of getting your name out there and talking about one feature or talking about how you can, if you're in finances again, manage your debt. So talk about managing your debt and then all of a sudden they start coming to your site from that article and you say, yeah, you know, here's five tips to manage your debt. And one of them is a feature on your website. And they start coming to use the feature and all of a sudden you realize no one's coming back. Now you've gotten invaluable data about them coming to your site and then where they're exiting. Then you can start reaching out to these users and why, why they're exiting, find out new things. Um, leveraging PR is much more than just kind of throwing your name out there. It's also seeing what people respond to, why they come, um, where they leave. It, it's, it's a really comprehensive approach, I think, and very, very invaluable. Do you guys have any questions, by the way? I don't want this to be kind of me talking at you. I want to make sure that I'm helping in any way I can. Yeah. 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 No, that's a really great question. The question was, have you found which outlets or are you finding that different outlets are better for different types of users? And the answer is absolutely. Um, actually, you would think that my target demographic would be core bridal and I am writing for some core bridal publications, but some of our best actually our most interactive and engaged users are coming from websites that aren't core weddings. So Daily Candy, Huffington Post, I get some really great interaction on the website from those headline news. I got some really great polls. Um, it may not be the most core targeted publication for me. It's obviously a national publication without core bridal, but the users that are coming there that are bridal are super engaged and they came on, saw something they were interested in, and then I kind of learned from that. They're also some you know core bridles that do work really well but yeah absolutely i find that if i want to go for a more conservative kind of like i did a sorry guys bear with me barnyard beautiful spread which was all about rustic weddings and i did it in southern weddings magazine you learn a lot about conservative brides southern brides from a publication like that versus somebody that's coming from daily candy weddings that may be a little bit more trend forward um, segmenting and seeing where your audience, maybe, you know, Southern publications aren't really working well for me right now. So that's something I have to look at. I'm not getting much pull from the Southeast region. Why? Is that because of the content I'm putting out there? Um, you know, once a Southern Weddings Magazine 
article hits, are they coming? Are they staying? As opposed to if something happens in New York, you know, are the New York girls staying for longer? And then kind of learning from that um, age differences, obviously, you know, if I'm talking to an, if I'm in Red Book or I'm in an older publication, uh, you know, an older skewed publication, are those better target users? And, you know, obviously that's going to come back to your brand persona too. Once you learn these things and what's hitting and what isn't, you may have to tweak your brand persona a little bit. Um, another thing I want to say too is, I've always, one of the things that Chris said to me when he asked me to come here is, I really want you to come because you're so excited about what you're doing. And I want you to help motivate and get people excited and understand the impact that you can have. I have so many friends that wake up every morning unexcited about what they're doing with their life. And I think it's so sad because you're spending 40 plus, 50 plus, 60 plus hours a week doing things that you're not passionate about. So if you're at a company that you're not passionate about, you know, leave. If you're super passionate about what you're doing, execute and like push that passion onto others. Um, there's something to be said for sitting down, find your top 10 users on your website and sit down and tell them why you're excited about what you're doing and see if the response is the same. There may be certain things that you're super passionate about that maybe don't get your users as excited. It's really easy to get caught up in your own excitement and to kind of start building and not really failing fast. You know, see what sticks, see what doesn't, but make sure that you're pushing that passion to others, also to your company culture. Get your company, get your designers, get your developers out into the public, meeting with people, meeting with editors, going to networking events, um, Raising funding, you know, that's been one of the biggest issues, I think, for startups in the Valley, is getting to that next milestone before you die, right? So we just raised our first round, and we raised a round of 580K was our first note. And I had no money when we came to San Francisco, absolutely none. We were about ready to die, and I was sitting in a coffee shop um, at the Center Cafe in San Francisco, and this I feel like, you know, people say, oh, this would only happen here, but it can really happen anywhere. And just started talking. I was sitting on a couch and I turned to the guy sitting next to me and I said, you know, hey, just wanted to talk to you. I feel like I should know your name since we're sitting on a couch together. And he started laughing. I'm from outside of Washington, D.C. He's from outside of Washington, D.C. And we started to talk and I just maintained that relationship. He was another founder of a company, Chart.io, um, Business Analytics and I just said, hey, I'd love to kind of pick your brain about business analytics. We became friends. I would answer his questions. He would answer mine. And little did I know that he was an angel investor and that he had a very extensive investment network. From you know the time I started with him, he was a, a great resource. And I found out he was an angel investor. And I never brought up him investing. And my founder would say, you know, God, do it. Just say something. <laughs> I was like, listen, he knows what I do. If he wants to invest, he will. And one day, it was actually after we'd had a really great press push, he said, I love what you're doing and I love your enthusiasm and I want to invest. From meeting him, and then he started to in, in, introduce me to other people. From meeting him, of my 580K that we raised, through him and his network, we raised 450. From me, him meeting me on a couch. And I say that because I think it's so important to get out there. You never know who you're going to meet. Another 25K from, came from a guy that I met at a happy hour a networking happy hour for 500. And we talked about business and what you know, made us tick and what we were passionate about. And he said, you know, this is contagious. He was engaged. He said, I, I want to be a part of this. I think this is great. He was making one investment for the whole year. And I almost didn't go to that happy, happy hour. I said to my co-founder, I'm exhausted. I don't feel like going. So the reason why I bring that up is it's so important. And I, that's why I'm so excited that you guys are here because obviously you understand this. It's so important to network. It's so important to get out there. And people see if you're passionate about an idea, that is so contagious. Whether it's an editor that you're meeting that's going to write about your company. And you know maybe the first few stories that you do with them, you're just answering some questions or putting in a small quote. And eventually, they cover you for no reason. And that has happened to me before, where all of a sudden, I get a really big press bump. And I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? And they've written in a piece about what we're doing just because I built a good relationship with them. Or it's going through investors and meeting people, networking, and all of a sudden, you know, your funding's coming together because people see, people invest in a team and they see what you're doing and they're excited about what you're doing and so they're giving you their funding and they're giving you their money because they believe in what you're doing. Or it's because you're getting out there and working with your users. I went to go listen to Jess, um, who's the founder of Polyvore. If you're not familiar with that, it's an e-commerce site. They do some fantastic stuff with content curation and I was super inspired by what she was doing. And one of the things she said to me really struck a chord. She said, we've worked so closely with our users 
that we have a power user that after a few months, she was building boards all over the place and boards are basically where you can kind of pick different images and build fashion inspiration, that they noticed that she hadn't come to the site in a while. And so they emailed her and they found out, I guess family was monitoring her email and wrote back and said she's really sick. She had cancer and she hadn't been on the site in a few months. So they not only knew the user so well that they noticed when she wasn't there anymore, but then they decided to go through her boards and pick five of her favorite things and send her a care package. When she was sick, they sent it to her in the hospital. And she's back on the site using it. And I say this not you know, to say, oh gosh, you've got to go after every single one of your users, but they paid attention. And that story is something that is really representative of the way they interact with their users. And I felt so guilty leaving, listening to her talk because I didn't have a user best friend. I couldn't say that I knew the names or where they were from, their names, my power users' names, where they were from, what they do. And Jess could list her top 25. Find your power users, get out of the room, go visit them. Get on a flight and round up your power users and do a tour de force and go meet them and find out what they like about your company and talk to them about why they're using it. Talk to them about what they hate, what they love. You have no idea how far that goes. I write people emails just when I notice that they've created a really good list on the site or when I notice that they've been interacting a ton and say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. You know, can I answer any of your questions? Is there anything I can do for you? Their responses are so incredible. It really is amazing to think that, I mean, we all got in startups for a reason, right? To make an impact. And you're not making much of an impact if you're sitting in a room building for what you think is what you should be building, but not for what other people think is. You know, are you listening to them? Are you talking to them? Are you really making an impact in your community? I know that one of the things that Chris really strives for is to make Cincinnati, you know, not the equivalent of San Francisco or of Silicon Valley, but its own entity and its own really cool area that's making an impact. And the farther that you guys can go to make an impact in other areas in the US, and for people to say, oh yeah, I know that company. I know the founder of that company. He came and visited me and took me out to coffee. Or I just Skyped with him. You don't have to travel. If you need to get on a Skype call, do it. Set out time every week, you know, once a week for an hour to call your five top users. And start going down the list and watch what happens to your engagement. It's absolutely unbelievable. Are any of you guys doing that now? Do you know your power users? Anybody? One? Anyone else? Two. It's okay. I hung my head in shame last time I left the talk too. It's like, whoa, I've got some work to do. <laughs> um, but it really does make such a difference. So, you know, getting out and meeting with investors, getting out and meeting with press, getting out and meeting with your users. Another thing I would say that's super important that I've learned through my kind of journey um, over the past few years being in startups is how easy it is to think that you're on the right path with something and how quickly a user can change that perspective. And it's scary, you know, it really is. And it can be defeating. And I know that there are moments where, you know, you wanna throw your hands up in the air because you thought you had the next big thing. And someone's like, oh God, I would never use a site like that. But getting together with your users, mocking things up on a piece of paper before you build it and showing it to your users and say, where do you think you would click here? Where do you think you'd, you'd go here? Oh, what do you think that does? Saves you so much development time and gets you instant feedback. So I would, you know, I would say that getting out of the room is really important. If you guys aren't already doing that, start doing that. Does anyone have any questions about that? That's a great, great question. Um, building a brand persona actually is, I mean, it's really near and dear to my heart because it's not something I did for my first company and I think it's a, a big way I kind of messed up and something that I learned from. But what went, what went through my process actually, or my thinking process was, was finding one person that I felt like was going to be addicted to my website. They say that it's better to be super interesting to a small group of people than kind of interesting to a large group of people. So I took a bride and I thought, if I'm going to have a voice, how am I going to be this person's maid of honor in their wedding, their best friend? How am I gonna be that website that they say I could not have done the wedding planning without this website? You can build multiple personas, but I think it can start to get a little bit disjointed. Um, I would start to focus on one key user, one key user case, one key brand persona. It doesn't mean you can't come back and tweak it and change it. You probably will, and if you aren't, you're getting lazy. Um, 
But what I would say is having one group that you say, I'm going to be so addictive and so useful to this group and this you know, brand persona is going to represent this group so well that to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter if the other people aren't using it because I've become invaluable to this segment of the audience. And then you can start kind of moving on and building out. Um, the design, the development, the PR should all relate to that core one person. You can also start to do multiple. So let's say if you are doing our first website was kind of two-tiered, right? So we were going after the brides and we were also going after the vendors. You may need, if you have a you know, segmented audience like that, to have a couple of brand personas, who's my vendor, who's my bride, or you know, whoever it is in your case. But I would start really focusing with one, especially if you've never done a brand persona before. Um, some of the questions that you should ask yourself is, there's, there's different spectrums, right? So is my voice going to be passive? And what I mean by that is, if you go on Pinterest, or you know, there are a lot of websites out there that don't have a super active voice. If you go on Mint, Mint doesn't shout at you with who their persona is. How many of you guys use MailChimp? For your, yep, okay. So MailChimp is a very active voice. You go on there and there's that adorable little monkey saying hilarious things every time you send out an email. And I genuinely feel more attached to that website based on that brand persona. That is a brand persona. Now that's a very tangible brand persona, but they've chosen to have a really active voice. Um, someone like Fab, uh, Seth with Fab, he's, a, he's awesome. And Fab is a great, it's an interior design website, but they have a very active voice as well. All of their product descriptions are super out there, kind of in your face. They're talking about what they like, what they don't like. Um, Mint is very passive. A lot of people feel super close to Mint. Mint has been amazing for my financial recovery, but um, a lot of people love it. That's a much more passive voice. So I think that's the first thing you need to decide. Are we going to be super out there or are we going to be passive? Um, are, is my user more conservative? Are they more liberal? Are they, where are they located? So using your analytics to build your persona is super important. Where are you getting the most users? Or you can say, you know what? Our brand persona right now, we're getting a lot of users from the South, but what I want our brand persona to be is someone that's much more widespread that kind of encompasses all of America. So maybe you're using your analytics to say, wow, we're really missing a target here on the West Coast. How do we make our brand persona something that's a little bit more attractive to people in the West? Is your brand persona a, uh, like, like one core user you're targeting, or is your brand persona the, the, kind of the, um, the, the personality of your brand? OK, that's a great question. So it was the brand persona, is it one person you're targeting, or is it the personality of the brand? And it's both, actually. So what I did was I went online and took a picture of Blake Lively on the red carpet, and I loved her style sense. And I kind of envisioned her. I gave her a different name. Uh, I gave her Taylor, because we're tailored. So I said her name was Taylor. And I went through what I was looking for from, from a user, what I wanted to deliver to her, and then how, if she were out speaking about me, if I had my biggest power user out speaking about me, what would she say? Why did she love me and what did she say? And so when you're talking about your one user, okay, so who are we targeting? This is the girl we're targeting. And then how does she really represent who we are? So it's kind of twofold, right? Does that make sense? Okay, cool. And you guys can, sorry, here you go, yeah. That's a great question too. So the question was, how are you identifying where your users are coming from and what tools are you using? We're, we've actually built dashboards on Google. They're super helpful to kind of tell me where are they coming from? How long are they, in sta they staying? Where are they dropping off? Um, I also would say when it comes to SEO and getting your brand out there, and this could be a whole other conversation, but making sure that you're tracking everything. So when I do, a publica when I do an article in a publication, I have keywords linked that are specific to that publication. So when an article, when, when traffic starts coming in from an article, I can say, okay, they clicked on the word veil, you know, vintage veil. And I can start say, seeing what in the content is actually more, I would say, interesting to them. Um, when it comes to the analytics, it's, it's Google Analytics, but that made me think of the SEO stuff, so I got a little off track with you there, but <laughs> yes? Yeah, that, it is an internal tool. So we build a dashboard to see, um, it's, our, it's our tailored API, and, and we use our dashboard to see, okay, these 10 people, how many lists have they created? 
What content are they clicking on? What are they not clicking on? And then reaching them out from there, uh, reaching out to them from there. But one of the things that's been super helpful for us is actually the face-to-face. -face. Um, as much as analytics are needed, data is needed, you cannot build a business without having it. I would say that the face-to-face -face talks actually are really teaching us the most about what they like and what they don't like. Um, we can, you know, we can immediately tell now if we start to build a feature, if they're going to be receptive or not. Sometimes we're off, but just from talking to them and seeing what they want is actually even more helpful for me personally than the data. Of course you need it, but once you find out who's really using your website, going out that, and then take the people that also, you know, instead of just going for your power users, go to the bottom of that list. See the people that signed up and then haven't come back for six months and then go to them and say, hey, listen, we noticed that you signed up. Why didn't you come back? Tell us everything that sucks about our website. Be blunt. Tell us what sucks. We want to hear it. That's actually been, so the question was, once you have 10 users, you know, do you continue to build that persona? Or do you, like, do you change it once you've got them? So that's actually been a question that we've gone through internally. Um, we were building a feature, or we're starting to build a feature, and one of the guys said, why don't we reach out to our users and see if they'd want this feature? And then our designer said, well, wait a second, maybe, the, it's, not a, maybe it's not what our current power users want, but maybe all the users we haven't reached out to yet, maybe they would want it. Maybe we need to go to talk to brides that aren't even on the site. I mean, we need to tweak who we're reaching to. So I think that's just something that you have to personally kind of talk through. If you feel like you're having a lot of success with your brand persona, I would say stick with it. If it's one of those ideas that you think, okay, something's not working here, something tells me this could be a lot bigger, something tells me we're not really identifying with our core demographic, then tweak it. Um, as much as you need to, I, I think people get into, as much you need to be consistent, I think people get out of the startup mode. It's really easy when you've been working on the same idea for six, nine months, a year, to stop being startup mentality. You guys should be failing and failing fast. And when you fail, you should think that's amazing. So if you build a brand persona and you have an idea and you're reaching out to your users and they're telling you it sucks, it's okay to change it. Um, even if you're married to something, no pun intended, um, even if you're married to something and you, you've put in all this time and you don't want to give up and you, you know, you're, you're, I've invested so much time in this, like who cares? I look back on ideas that I was married to that I kept pitching, kept pitching, kept pitching that weren't hitting and that I should have dropped ages before. But we all have a little bit of ego in us, and when you put a lot of elbow grease into something, you don't want to give up on it. So even if you have a brand persona that you think is like the most amazing thing ever, if you talk to your users and they're engaged with it, and all of a sudden you know they say, "Well, actually, I'd like you to tweak this," like don't be afraid to. I think you just have to listen, and and I think it's important too to realize that if your brand persona isn't someone you're happy with, and you want to change it, that's okay too. You know, it's not like you can't have a voice in this. It's just being open to other people's perspectives about it. Need to go? Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> can I? Sorry. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, guys.